Hello everyone, my name is Sue Babin and I'll be the host of today's show, It Takes a Village. The show is an initiative of the Village for Rhode Island Foster and Adoptive Families to provide information to foster and adoptive and kinship families within Rhode Island um, who have made a commitment to foster or adopt a child. Um, we've created the show as part of an outreach effort to provide information and support to families and to per potentially recruit recruit more families to be an anchor, and to provide insights and personal experiences on available resources within Rhode Island. The topics and issues that we're gonna be discussing on today's show um, are from the perspective of families that have been involved in foster and kinship care. Today, for our first cable show, we're gonna talk about kinship care, what that means, and uh, supports that are available to families within Rhode Island. So welcome everybody. Um, I'd like to introduce our guests for today's show. On my right, we have Rachel Briggs, who has been a kinship caregiver for over 10 years. And on my left, we have Kelly Fluett. Kelly is a founding member of the village. She's also a current board member. And she herself has been a foster um, and adoptive and kinship family member for over 17 years. So welcome to today's show. Thank you. Um, I'd like to thank you very much for coming on board. Um, and we're gonna start with a couple of questions. So Kelly, can you tell me a little bit about what The Village is all about? So The Village is, a, we're a nonprofit organization. Uh, we were founded in March of 2016 um, by a group of foster and adoptive parents. Um, we basically just um, provide support and services for foster and adoptive families. Okay, and why was the village formed? What was the reasoning behind the start of the organization? So, when we, it probably goes back about 10 years. We started, um, we met, I met a group of women from, um, at a support group that uh, I got an email from DCYF that they were gonna start a support group. So I thought, I'd been a foster parent for eight years. I thought, yeah, great, let me, I didn't know any foster families. So, um, so I went and, um, I, real, I met this group of women that um, were amazing, and we went there, and, and um, I basically thought, how did I, be, how was I a foster parent for this long without <laughs> getting these services and these supports? I'm around people that know me and get it and you know, are involved in the system and all the stuff that goes along with the system. So um, you know, even though we met once a month, we started just becoming really close friends and we were like, we can't do this once a month. We have to do this more often. And we got together all the time and we got so much support from each other and it was just so nice to be around people that understood what we were going through. Walking in your shoes, yeah. Right, the same thing, so we thought, do other pa foster parents have this? Do they have what we have? Because we need this. Like this is just, it kind of keeps us going. And so that's when we started talking about um, basically starting our own organization and, and giving other foster parents um, an opportunity to connect with others that are in the same situation that they're in. So that's, that's basically awesome. how we started. Awesome, thank you. There's, uh, there's children in every state who are involved in foster care, mm -hmm. and it's an opportunity for anyone to provide stability in a child's life um, who cannot say, stay safely in their own home. So, Rachel, can you tell us a little bit about, so what is the difference between foster care and kinship care? What exactly does kinship care mean? Sure, so there's like an inside joke amongst kinship providers, and we'll say, when did you get the call? <laughs> right? And we all compare stories. Did you get it at 3 in the morning? Did you get it at 2, 12, <laughs> while you was on vacation? Right? So the difference between kinship and typical fostering care, foster families, adults who decide, oh, I want to adopt a child, right? They go through this mental process and they talk to one another and they take their time right, to decide if this is the right fit for their family. And they go do training. Mm -hmm. And at any time during that training, they could go, yeah, no, never mind, I'm good. Or let's regroup, let's huddle and then talk some more, right? So typical fostering families have that opportunity to go back and forth and have that dialogue and extensive amounts of training um, to make sure it's something they really wanna commit to. 
On the other hand, kinship get the call. <laughs> we get the call two in the morning, three in what the morning. What exactly does kinship mean? So kinship is when you have, the adult had a pre-existing relationship with the okay. child. So that could be a teacher, it could be a coach, it could be your son or daughter's friend, right? Because you mm -hmm. knew them through your son or daughter. Mm -hmm. So in my life, my kinship is relative kinship. So I'm related to my children that I adopted. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so kinship, you get the call, you're usually asked if you could take the children, something just happened that they need to be placed. So you have that moment to say yes or no. Can it be grandparents? It could totally be grandparents. In fact, I don't know the absolute fact, the numbers, but I believe most of our kinship families are grandparents. I do trainings for mm -hmm. parents that have just been placed and predominantly all the parents in the room most of the time are grandparents. Can it also be and siblings? It could be siblings. If you okay. had a pre-existing relationship with that child that now needs placement, you could be a kinship provider for that child. Okay, well that yeah. makes sense. And I believe every state has both foster care and kinship care, so it's not just something that exists within Rhode Island, is no. that correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay. There's families everywhere, there's children everywhere. What do you think the, the benefits of kinship care are? Kelly, can you speak to that? What is the most so, important thing about kinship care? I think it's, um, it's important that um, the kids know who, the person, where they're going, other than being, you know, with traditional care, you just, you just pulled and you don't know where you're gonna end up, you know? Um, mm -hmm. It's a scary situation for a lot of kids. Either way, it's scary, but it's a lot more comforting for a child that's going to somebody's house that they already know, they already have a relationship with. Um, that's definitely a huge benefit to kinship care. Can I think, add? Rachel, yeah. yeah. I think, too, in, in, in respects to blood relative kinship care, like in my life, um, I think it, a lot of the challenges that happen in families are generational. Mm -hmm. It didn't just happen with that generation, right? Mm -hmm. And I think when you're able to take in a family member's child, you allow your family to reset. It gives your family a chance to get it right this time. Mm -hmm. And you can do that within your family and helping everyone in your family. So I think for me, that was very important that I was able to help my family to come back and get things right. We often say stop the cycle. Mm -hmm. Well, when you can take in a family member's child, you truly can stop the cycle within your family. So that's what I love about kinship. Cool. Yeah. What is fictive care? What does that mean? Um, I'm pretty sure that it means when you're not blood related okay. mm -hmm. to the child, like uh, Rachel was saying, a teacher or a coach or you know your child's friend or something. Those would be considered fictive care. Okay. Givers. I guess in my case, I'm also a kinship family, and that's the situation that I'm in. I I knew the mom. Um, and we've been friends for over 10 years. Um, she was unable to care for the children, and so I'm um, uh, a friend, um, and uh, so I guess I meet that definition of yes. fictive care. Mm -hmm. Welcome to the club. Welcome to the club, and I did get the call at one o'clock in the morning. <laughs> um, okay, let's, um, let's talk a little bit about, so once you get that call, what are the next things that happen in terms of supports that are available to families that do decide to take in a relative or someone that they know um, in, in Rhode Island? So what kind of supports are available? We'll start, let's start mm -hmm. with Rachel. Sure. Name a couple and then we'll sure. go over to you, Kelly. Yeah, sure. So um, I'm thinking back 10 years ago, right, when I got the call and my children came to live with me. I, I don't know how. But I think and so many do you have? Let's so five. Five. Yeah. Yep. And what are the age ranges? So 15, 13, 11, almost 10, and seven. Wow. So I'm happy to be sitting down right now. <laughs> yes. Did they all come in at once or did they come no, at once? No, no. So um, we got one of our children was placed first and she was with us for two years. Mm -hmm. And then we got the second call. Mm -hmm. And they, 
her four siblings needed to be placed. Wow. And so we said yes, without hesitation. Well, there was some hesitation, <laughs> but I mean, for the most part, like we wanted to keep our family together. And then about a year later, we got a third call. And um, they had another sibling that needed placement. So we had, um, it was probably like three years of placement wow. over yeah, you know, a span of three so years. So what kind of initial supports did you get from uh, within Rhode Island? Right, so I think the village was like the first one. I don't know if like a bat signal went out and then you all knew we got <laughs> placement, but like they called us and was like, we have this organization that you can come and talk to other people that are on the same path as you. Mm. And that right there was like, please help us. Mm -hmm. Because we were just kind of like, we're parents now, you know? And when I say we, I'm a twin and we co-parent our children together. We mm. adopted them formally together. Mm -hmm. So we were just kind of like single women and then first time parents mm. to five children. Wow. <laughs> so that was like our transition into parenthood. So we definitely needed support and we got it through the village, just going to talk to someone who was like, I get that. Mm. Yeah, like you do, oh, <laughs> thank you, right? right? And then Adoption Rhode Island offered therapeutic services, not only for my children, but for us as adults, mm -hmm. um, which is crucial. And uh, um, I'm thinking of fun things we would do, foster forward, mm -hmm offered like cookouts and going to the park, like outings, mm -hmm. you know, for the children to see they are not the only children that are living this different life, right? Because right. so often our children think it's just, well, children in general think it's just me, right? Mm -hmm. And it was great for us, even though we're telling them, no, it's other kids, for them to see that. To meet mm -hmm. other children, yes. right? Yes, and you know, the financial compensation we get from um, DCYF is mm -hmm. extremely helpful. Mm -hmm. um, is that a monthly it is, compensation? It is, yep. it is a monthly compensation and it's great. It, it helps us to give to our children child, yeah. opportunities to support them yep. right, in their basic needs, but also create opportunities for okay. other things. Yeah. Okay. Kelly, what else is out there for people that become kinship families? What kind of support is available? So um, through the village, we have, um, we have a donation closet, which is, you know, we get secondhand items in very good condition donated to us. Clothing of all different sizes, baby equipment, diapers, that's not secondhand, <laughs> um, <laughs> wipes. Um, we, um, we're always getting stuff in and people are, you know, coming and, um, and trading, you know, with each other, um, which leads me to our online support group that mm. we have. So we have an online support group that has uh, over 300, I think this was like 320 something members as of um, recently. Um, and um, that's a huge support for people because um, we, we also offer in-person you know, support groups um, throughout the state. We have different um, locations throughout the state. Of course, it's virtual now because of COVID, but um, not everybody can make it to, you know? Right. So the online support is, is good because those groups are once a month. And um, like I said, they're online, but when we had them in person, we offer um, dinner and babysitting services. So parents can come bring their kids and they don't have to worry about that. Um, it's an hour and a half. Um, now we're doing it virtually, so mm -hmm. we're having them later at night. Um, but not everybody can come, and sometimes right. people are in a crisis and they need advice yeah. right away. So that's why they go on to the online group. And the online group is extremely active and extremely helpful. And, um, you know, even though we have that donation closet for people, um, people have come, the community has come together as foster and adoptive parents. So you see people, you know, offering, you know, oh, my son just grew out of 2T, does anybody need that? And then someone's like, yeah, I could yeah. use it. And, and someone else chimes in, well, I have the next size up if you need that. So it's it's great mm -hmm. that we have that closet, but we also have our community together that can can. Well, that's awesome that the families other. are helping each other out. Yeah. Um, well, th for the second half of our show, we're gonna talk a little bit more about supports 
Um, I know the time went by really quickly. Um, mm -hmm. I'd like to thank both of you for, for coming to today's show and talking about your own personal experiences and sharing some information with people that are out there, um, which is really important. So thank you both. Thank you. You're welcome. Welcome back to the second half of our show. And on my left, we have Lori Tapazada. Um, Lori is a kinship caregiver who works closely with the Rhode Island Department of Children, Youth, and Families to support kinship caregivers. That's and right. she's also the chairperson of the Rhode Island Kinship Council. So we're going to talk about that. And we're going to continue to talk with Kelly about supports that are available within Rhode Island. But first, let's talk a little with Lori. Right. So Lori, can you share some information with us about um, uh, children that are in foster care within Rhode Island? All right. So in Rhode Island, we have you know, close to 2,000 kids in care, mm -hmm. actually about 1,800 and something. And the number of kids in care is actually going down, believe it or not, because of the work that Rhode Island puts into identifying and finding kinship caregivers. Because, you know, as the ladies talked about earlier, there's so many benefits to that, but one of them is actually having the stability of the kids put in the kinship home. Right. So, and what percentage of kids are actually in uh, kin with kinship families? Well, believe Island? it or not, seventy percent of kids that are in care are in kinship homes, wow. and I That's have to awesome. say it is beyond awesome because Rhode Island is a leader in the U.S. Hmm. for taking that time to search, find you know kinship providers, and place the, the children in kinship care. That percentage is right up at the top of you know, of the states. So we are doing an awesome job in Rhode Island around that. And so why has, we talked a little bit about this before, but why has Rhode Island um, through DCYF um, uh, identified kinship care as the best um, placement for children? Well, the thing is uh, foster care has evolved so much over the years. Um, and I may be revealing my age by saying back in the day, <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, the department didn't even really want to communicate with the families of origin. It just was a no-no. Mm. And now here we are, there's a growing realization across the nation mm. of the importance of kinship caregivers and have come to now understand through many, many longitudinal studies that kids do so much better when they're placed within kin instead of in a community placement. They. The ladies already mentioned it's less traumatic yep. because they're going into a place they know. Um, it helps them retain their self-identity mm. because it's weird. Like when you go from one home and then, you know, all of a sudden you're in a different community, maybe with a, diff a family of a different race or whatever, it's confusing. So it helps them maintain their identity. And they have found that when they follow the kids along, the kids have much better outcomes as adults, mm. you know, um, for compared to kids that had to be taken out of home and placed with community foster families. So it's definitely less traumatic. I mean, that's it's a way key. less traumatic. Um, the kids do so much better. Mm -hmm. And so we've come to understand that not only do we want to talk to the biological families, but we want to keep the kids as much as possible within either their biological family, extended family, or with families you know, that are already known to the family or to the child. OK. So tell us a little bit about some of the resources that are available to families that uh, are involved with DCYF as kinship. OK. So I believe Rachel brought up what a shock it can be to become a kinship family. <laughs> there were no planning involved. You might suddenly, you know, you went to bed with no children, and the next day you woke mm -hmm. up with a baby and two mm -hmm. toddlers. Um, and a lot of times you're not prepared. So when the family gets opened up to the department, the department um, offers assistance in those early days. You know, they can, the family can request a crib or a bed or a car seat. Mm -hmm. Um, under certain circumstances, if needed, maybe an emergency clothing voucher or, you know, they support them as well as they can. After that, they offer a monthly stipend mm -hmm. that's meant to go toward the care of the child. Mm -hmm. They offer daycare for working families, which mm -hmm. is critical because sometimes that's one of the most painful mm -hmm. things. It's like, how do I go to work until I get these kids in care? And they also offer um, medical mm -hmm. to all of the kids in care. And then in addition to that, I'm very proud to say that, um, you know, as I said, Rhode Island's doing so well, you know, with, with finding kinship families. 
but the department also realizes that's not enough. I can place the kids in the kinship families and then just say, okay, there was a belief at one time that, okay, they're in their families, we don't have to worry about it. Mm. No, kinship families need support. They mm. need support. So um, the department has been building supports around kinship families, one of which is a peer mentor program, which I run. And it's amazing the work that's being done by my team of peer mentors who are really there to support the family emotionally because believe me it's an emotionally complex experience to be a kinship caregiver and family relationships can get all kinds of crazy and wonky and mm. you know there's just a lot to it so they provide emotional support they answer questions because sometimes you know the social workers as I'm sure everybody knows they have huge caseloads they are so busy so sometimes it's hard to get a hold of the social worker you know quickly mm -hmm. so the peer mentors can actually answer questions for the family they can help teach the family how to advocate for themselves if there's something going on that the family's upset about you know so they can actually teach them you know who do you talk to how do you do it to help advocate to resolve some of those issues that they have they give them information they give them referrals and they try like heck to transition a family you know after a certain period of time to community support. So for example, let's say someone's been in the peer mentor program six months, things have stabilized, but we don't wanna just say, okay, well, it was nice knowing you. Mm -hmm. We try to transition them into support groups as Kelly was talking about, you know, through the village or through Adoption Rhode Island, um, you know, or the online group. So we try to make sure that they're connected to every possible community resource that they can be. I know for me, when I first um, became a, a kinship caregiver, um, no one in my family had ever been involved in foster care. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and um, I reached out to my friends over at the village who I did happen to know a couple of people that were on the board. And it was incredibly reassuring to meet other families that had been through the process, that yes. knew the questions to ask, because as a new family coming into the system, you don't know what you're eligible for. You don't know nope. who to talk to or where to go. That's right. Um, I was able to get some clothing um, for um, my child um, initially, and Foster Forward also came over with a bag of clothes and also offered um, some support through their, their organization. So that was really important to me, to meet other people that me too. <laughs> had already been uh, a foster parent or a kinship caregiver. So I, th I, I we can't underestimate that, no. it, that point, that when people do become an anchor in a child's life um, and decide to enter into foster care, that there's other tons of families out there that you can talk with at any time about whatever the issues are. No, so that's sure. really important. Can you tell us a little bit about some of the community resources? I know Kelly mentioned some stuff, but other kinds of things that are available to families that are out there. Well, there's some types of supports that are available to all families. And if families haven't been involved before, like for example, um, food stamps, yep. you know, as an example, yep. heating yep. assistance, yep. cash assistance, whatever. If, if, you know, there are community supports out there that our peer mentors can help to connect our kinship families to. So they're help like them, a bridge. Like a bridge, yeah. exactly. And then of course they have to be eligible just like any other family. Right. So it's mm -hmm. not an automatic. Um, we make sure they get connected to WIC, um, you know, and that kind of thing. And then the village is a huge resource for families and um, the department does partner with the village and with Adoption Rhode Island to, mm -hmm. to you know, be able to offer kinship specific support groups because the thing is when you're kinship, you know, if you're in a regular support group for, you know, uh, community foster families, a lot of what you might talk about is navigating the relationship with the bio family and I'm having this and that challenge or whatever. And as a kinship, you're sitting there going, yeah, so it's my daughter. <laughs> You know, so it's, you just don't have that same comfort level. But when you're in a room with other kinship families, it's such a relief Makes because sense. we all understand, right. you know. And I remember when it first happened with me, I'm raising my grandson. Um, I was in that journey for one solid year mm. before I knew anybody else, any other, you know, family. And one day I got a call and somebody said to me, Lori, 
there's this thing called the village. <laughs> you have to call these ladies. They get it. They understand. And I was like, all right, I'll give it a try. And I called up and ended up sobbing one hour on the phone. It was such a relief, like, oh my God, I'm not alone anymore. And that's the biggest thing for families that they say when they go to a support group or to a training. Um, the department does offer in-service training and kin-specific training and the village offers training. That is what, if you ask them what they thought about the training, the first thing on their list is, I know I'm not alone. Tell I'm us, not the um, only one. with the time that we have left, I want to cover briefly, um, there's a Rhode Island Kinship Council. Yes. So what is the purpose of the Kinship Council? The purpose of the Kinship Council is because... And what is it? Well, it, it's a group that comes together, um, and the group includes different areas from with, within DCYF, um, other state departments that impact in one way or another the lives of kinship caregivers <laughs> with health you know, um, resources like Community Health or Bradley or whatever with faith-based organizations. And of course, most importantly, with kinship caregivers to come together around the table and to really sit and discuss and identify the needs of kinship families because that voice has been missing. You know, as kinship family, you know, rises in terms of taking placement of the children, we have to know how to help them, how to meet their needs. Mm -hmm. And we can't do it like the department can't do it by themselves. You know, so there, it's a whole group that we work together to identify the needs of kin, to launch certain, you know, projects that may help to answer those needs and, and to allow monthly? the voice quarterly. Quarterly. We quarterly. Okay. But sometimes we, we have little mini projects where we'll meet in between okay. if we're working on something. That's great. Um, so much going on in the state of Rhode Island yes. for, as with other states, with foster and uh, kinship care. Um, that's the uh, end of our program today. I'd like to thank you, Lori, so much for coming, and Kelly and uh, Rachel, who was here earlier. Uh, we hope that you have found this segment of It Takes a Village to be helpful, um, whether you're currently involved in foster care or you're thinking about becoming an anchor in a child's life. Um, we want you to take a look at the credits at the end of the show for any follow-up information that you have and to be able to contact those of us that are connected with the village or even contact Lori directly. So thank you so much and stay tuned for our next show. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.